One of the things that, whether you like it or not, or whether you know it or not, is that you're always influencing somebody, right? So through your words, through your actions, how you drive, what kind of neighbor you are, what kind of worker you are, co-worker you are, what kind of person you are, people are watching you and people know you. And uh, they, they, you have an influence on people. And so we want to talk a little bit about that because we're going to see that there's a number of ways that we can affect people. And as followers of Jesus Christ, hopefully, our desire is to have a positive influence on the people we come in contact with, whether they're friends, neighbors, uh, family members, or complete strangers. We want to have a positive impact. So uh, Jesus uh, maintained a really he, a big tent, but he also defined his kingdom tent. And we're going to talk a little bit about that because one of the first things we come to in the passage is John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, kind of tries to narrowly define the gospel tent. And so if you'd like to follow along with me, I wish you would. Uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 38. Mark chapter 9, verse 38. So as you're turning there, let me just say, <clears throat> this is a section where Mark is throwing a number. We know that Jesus went around and there were a number of sayings he said over and over and over. They were kind of things that he taught over and over and over. It wasn't just he said it once and that was it. He said these, and so John is putting a number of these statements together and a number of these together and kind of this, this if you want to put a, a, a title over it, it's, it's what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? And so we're going to look at a few of those. Uh, the first one is, uh, and the title for this one is, and it's the first point in your notes is, a disciple of Jesus maintains a big gospel tent. So let me read this passage and we'll talk about it and you'll understand kind of what I, where I'm going with it. <clears throat> this is Mark chapter 9, verse 38. Teacher, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because, it's not, because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for no one who has done a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me, for whoever is not against us is for us. Truly I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah, will certainly not lose their reward. So John tells us there's this man that his disciples catch, and he's casting out demons. And immediately John says, you need to stop. <laughs> you know, and there's, you're not one of us, so stop it, you know. And so uh, it's funny because we, we, we looked, if you remember a few weeks ago, we looked at, at disciples where they weren't able to cast out a demon. And so here's this guy able to do it. So I don't know if that was part of the issue there. You know, like, you know, you, you should be able to do that. We couldn't. Um, but the 12 are developing this sense of entitlement. They're, they're becoming a, kind of this exclusive club, not unlike the scribes and the Pharisees, right? Wasn't the scribes and the Pharisees' whole thing of, you don't measure up, you don't belong with us? And, and so the disciples, the 12, are starting to get this attitude. And Jesus says, no, no, no. He says, if they're for us, they're not against us. This is a good thing. So John sees his position uh, as one of entitlement and exclusive rather than a call to service. We talked about the whole service last weekend. And, and, and the argument on the road, remember the argument on the road, well, who's the greatest? I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. I'm going to sit on the right. I want to sit on the left. And now, um, you know, so now they're, they're, uh, they're having this, you're not from our club mentality. And so Jesus tells John uh, and the 12 that his tent is bigger than just 12. And, you know, sometimes we don't get that as, as, as a faith community. The question is, and, and here's what I want to talk about just for a minute, because this, churches have a hard time with this. Uh, you know, one of the things that churches get, take a hit on is, well, there's so many different denominations in churches, I just don't know which one to go to, and they all think they're right. And to a certain extent, there's a level of truth to that. Uh, sometimes we, we, we do kind of have an attitude. Uh, but John got it wrong. John says, uh, you know, he doesn't belong to our group. And Jesus says, no, 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 our group is bigger than just what you're viewing. So the question is, Jesus is essentially saying the gospel tent is pretty big. And sometimes churches, sometimes pastors, sometimes people within those churches limit the tent. And the question is, how do we know who's in and how do we know who's out? Well, we do. Jesus has given us a number of examples of knowing who's in and who's out. Who should be in the tent 
and who shouldn't be in the tent. And it's kind of surprising when you look at it. So that's the first part of what we want to look at. A disciple knows that the gospel tent is big, but it also knows that it, 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 though many are, are included in the tent, some are excluded. And uh, so let's look at first the, who are outside the tent. Why should somebody be outside the gospel tent? Well, we're told from Scripture, um, number one, they reject Jesus. They reject Jesus. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. That's an exclusive statement. Jesus is saying is, if, you're, if you don't believe that I'm the only way to God, to my Father in heaven, you're kind of outside the gospel tent. You're no longer in the gospel tent. And you've self-excluded yourself from the gospel tent because that's a non-negotiable. Uh, by the way, just those people who reject Jesus may not be in our tent, but they're not our enemies. That's really important for Christians to hear because sometimes we say, well, they're, they're not in our tent, so they're our enemies, you know. No, they're not. They're just not in our tent. And it's a little different. And other people who are not in our tent are those who preach a different gospel. Uh, this is what uh, Paul says in Galatians chapter 1. He says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now we say again, if anyone is preaching you a gospel other than the one you accepted, let him be under God's curse. Now he uses that phrase, under God's curse, twice. And that's the, the Greek word anathema. It basically just means, it's, it's very soft here. It really, it's damned to hell. <laughs> so Paul is saying, let them be damned to hell, you know? It, you know, there's no other gospel. So again, Jesus is the only way. Paul says, there's no other gospel. You can't be in the gospel tent if you reject the gospel or you teach another gospel. And I have all these wonderful examples of what is the other gospel, but I don't have time to go there. So I'm not going to. I'm going to continue to go on and try to define who's in and who's outside the tent. Let me give you another one. Those who aren't in the tent, they choose to argue and divide. They choose to argue and divide. Look at uh, what Titus 3.9 says. Paul writes this. He says, avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and arguments and quarrels about the law because these are unprofitable and useless. And then notice this, because I think churches sometimes allow these folks in the tent and they ought to just say, you know, you're not happy here. Why don't you go somewhere else? And it's okay to do that. Notice what he says. He says, warn a divisive person once and then warn them a second time. After that, have nothing to do with them. You may be sure that such people are warped and sinful, and they are self-condemned. So, so if, you, you can, if they choose, to, they, all they want to do is argue and divide and cause dissension, there's a point where you say, you know what, maybe you shouldn't be in the tent. It's not all about raising, you know, differences and, and, and fighting and arguing over minuscule, little, insignificant, not important points. Let me give you one more, one more uh, reason, or one more uh, group that aren't. Um, people who just, we shouldn't, if we're going to have this gospel tent, they have to believe Jesus is the only way. They can't preach a different gospel. They can't get tied up in these, these arguments about these minor things and, and be uh, divisive and, and all the time. Even when they're warned, hey, knock it off. They keep doing it. There's a point where you say, well, you know, why don't you go somewhere else? Because causing discord among the brothers is not one of the things that God says, oh, that's good. But there's one other one. They allow high-handed sin. Uh, look at what Paul writes in Corinthians. He says, I wrote you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or greedy or swindlers or idolaters. Now, notice what he's saying there. It's very important because what we do is say, okay, I, just don't, I shouldn't be with immoral people, you know. And, and so I should, you know, I should have this Christian cocoon that I crawl into so that all my friends are not immoral and, and I should never have contact with immoral people and and that's not what he says. Notice he puts that disclaimer there. He says, not meaning the people of this world who are immoral or greedy or swindlers or adulterers. He's talking about immoral people within church community. He says, don't allow immorality in the gospel tent. 
don't allow it. Because that's what was happening in the church at Corinth. He says this, in, in that case, you would have to leave this world. You, 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 but now I'm writing that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, a Christian, but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or slanderer, a drunkard or swindler. Don't even eat with such people. In other words, he says it's okay to say you're not part of the tent because you're not living the life, you're not showing any desire to live the life that's honoring to Jesus Christ. No, um, he's talking about those who are within the church community who are living immoral lives, and he's saying that you should not allow that person to go on unabated in, in, in their, in their uh, behavior. So that's who's not in the tent, okay? You know, pretty clear. Well, who is in the tent? Who is in the tent? Now, this may be surprising to you because sometimes we think we see people that I'm going to describe next, and you say, well, I don't think they should be in the tent. And Jesus says, no, no, they're in the tent. Well, who should be inside the tent? Well, number one, they may get their politics wrong. They may be of the other party. Uh, look at what uh, Matthew, it, it's, it's kind of an innocuous verse. It's just one verse. And we read it, we read through it as you're reading through the Bible or reading through a passage. We don't even think about it. But there's something deeper going on here. Um, Matthew chapter 10, verse 3. He's listing the disciples. Philip and Bartholomew, Ma uh, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector. Now notice, he does that. He, he, the other ones, he's just given their names. Matthew, he says, the tax collector. There's a reason why he's doing it. So hang on for a minute. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon, the zealot. There's a title again, right? Catch that. And Judas Iscariot. Do you notice there's only two guys that he gives a title? He, he tells, he says, Matthew, the tax collector, and Simon, or, excuse, Simon, the zealot. Okay, the tax collector would be for who? Rome. He would be working for Rome. Basically, he would be collecting taxes for the Roman government. And he would be seen by most Jewish people as kind of the enemy. Kind of not the... And they were known as swindlers. And they would collect too much tax. And, you know, there, was, there were things that, you know, there's a shady stuff going on there. Okay? Now you have Simon the Zealot. Well, who is Simon the Zealot? You know that part of the Bible, some Bibles have these books called the Maccabees? The Maccabees were the zealots. And, and, and they basically were the, the freedom fighters for the Jewish people. And they would, they would have these, they would do war against Rome. They would, they would try to get bands and they would try to take Rome out and, and they would have these battles. So you, have, so you, you could be more, more further divided politically. You have one person that is anti-Rome and wants to see the overthrow of Rome, and you have the other person who's working for Rome. They're on different sides of the aisle. Here's the thing. They're on the same team, though. They were Jesus' disciples. That's the statement that's being made here. Why don't we get that as a church? Why do we feel that somebody who has different political beliefs is our enemy. Is on the, it, it, the, Jesus says, no, the tent's wider, bigger than you think. Don't get called up in that game. Don't fall into the game that the world wants. You have to divide because somebody holds a different view politically than you. Matthew, Simon held very different views, but they were on the same team. They are on different sides of the aisle, but the same team. Uh, the second thing that we'll see is that people within the tent, people are allowed in the tent who struggle with sin. Um, look at what it says in Galatians 6, 1. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you may also be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. What are we saying here? We're saying that the, the, the tent, the gospel tent, includes people who haven't arrived, people who are sinners, people who don't have their act together, people who are imperfect, people who need a hospital, people who are healing, people that God's still working at, people who still fail in sin. It, that's what the church is. It's a bunch of sinners, and hopefully the, we acknowledge that we're all sinners. And so, in a sense... Well, the, the, the gospel tent includes everyone who struggles with sin. 
We haven't arrived. We're not perfect. We're not like the scribes and the Pharisees who says, well, we don't sin. We're perfect. We follow the law. We say, you know what? You know, I, the question is, have I, haven't, isn't have I sinned today? It's how many times have I sinned today? We acknowledge it. Number two, uh, the third point is that we have mixed motives. They will have mixed motives. Uh, you don't have this verse, but write it down. Philippians chapter 1, verse 15. Paul says this. He says, it is true that some people preach the gospel out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, um, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that every, in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice. So this says that sometimes people with an intent can treat each other in a pretty bad way. But that doesn't mean they're outside the tent. So this tent, Jesus, this tent is, is wide, it's big. But it, it is, in a certain sense, exclusive, but not in the way that we often think it is. We tend to make it exclusive in the way we want it to be exclusive, not the way that... It's, you know, we need to figure this out. John didn't figure it out. Jesus took t John to task, one of his best friends, as he walked on this earth. And he says, John, no, you're wrong here. You're wrong here. Um, so that's the first thing we want to look at. So what does the disciple do? The disciple understands what that gospel tent is all about, that it's much bigger than you think, and that it includes many more people than you think. But there are some that are excluded, and they're excluded because of their behavior and because of their beliefs. Um, here's the second thing we want to look at, and this is where we're going to go back to the text in Mark. A disciple of Jesus guards their gospel witness. A disciple of Jesus guards their gospel witness. Um, so let me pick it up at verse uh, 42. <clears throat> this is where we have a couple of passages that, where Mark is throwing a bunch of them together, and it, it's hard to, to know how they're related to one another. And so I'll do my best here uh, at this point. Uh, Mark chapter 9, verse 42. If anyone causes one of these little ones, and then he defines it, those who believe in me, to stumble... It would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands, uh, than with two hands to go to hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye uh, than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell, where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Two things that I want to say about this, and then I'll jump back into the passage for a minute. You know, whether you believe in hell or not, Jesus did. <laughs> and the other thing is, the thing about hell is some people say, well, is there real fire in hell? Well, no, it's not real fire. I mean, it's not like the fire we know. Because when fire burns something here, it's destroyed. It's gone. It's forever. But it basically says that the fire is not quenched. It's just, it's just, it's kind of an ongoing thing. Um, so those are two things. Um, people, people don't realize this, that Jesus talked a lot about hell and, and uh, he talked about some beautiful things, but he also talked about the awfulness of hell. And then notice it says, the last, uh, the last verse, it says, everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Have salt among yourselves and be at peace with one another. So we want to talk about <clears throat> this idea of what does it mean to be faithful and have a faithful gospel witness. Um, the first point here is that we're faithful by living within community. <clears throat> I think this is one of the hardest currents that we have to go against in our culture today. We live in a very individualistic, me first, um, introspective, selfish 
culture where my needs, my happiness, my joy, all those things come first before everyone else. And my actions, whether they affect others, is, is secondary to what my happiness. This is very different than many cultures in our world. There are many cultures that are community-based cultures that your actions, the first thing you would think about is how will this affect the community? We in America, in Christianity in America, we don't think that way. It's not, we're not wired that way. But we need to understand that in, as part of being part of the church, being a disciple of Jesus Christ, that we are not one, we are many. That we, we begin seeing we're connected, that our actions do affect others. That we must be cognizant that, that, that we are a body, we are a building, we are a community. That our actions are not our own. And Jesus says, if you cause one of these little ones to stumble by your behavior, it would be better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck. In other words, Jesus is saying, this is a very serious thing. You cannot just go about your life as business as usual and not understand that your life has an effect on other people. If you cause little, and, and these little ones, I think what Jesus is referring to is believers who are less mature. And if you cause them to stumble, that's a very serious thing because you're part of community. And this is a theme all through the New Testament. Let me give you a couple of verses on this. First, uh, Romans chapter 14. Let me read these verses. Paul writes this. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put a stumbling block or an ob obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. So when, whenever you believe, whatever you believe about these things, keep, be, keep them between yourself and God. Blessed is one who does not condemn himself by what he approves, but whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat because their eating is not from faith and everything that does not come from faith is sin. So what Paul's talking about, and I don't have time to go there, is he's talking about eating meat that has been offered to idols. So there was a big controversy in the early church of when a Christian, many of these people have come out of these cults where they would offer the meat uh, on the altar to the gods, and then they would sell the meat in the marketplace. And so some Christians would be able to go to the marketplace and buy the meat and eat it because they said, well, I don't believe in those gods, and the meat's good. I'm just going to take it home, and I'm going to eat it. And they had the freedom to make that choice. But there were others that came out of the tradition where the meat was offered up, and it was a very, they were, there was a, like a spiritual connection. They, they, it was like, they came out of it, and it, they were like creeped out by that. And they just thought, you shouldn't even touch that meat. You should have nothing to do with it. And so some Christians had the freedom to do it, and others didn't. And, and what, what Paul is saying here is, if you're one of those Christians that can eat that meat, you don't have any issues with it, it's okay. You go ahead and eat that meat. But do not flaunt your freedom in the face of those who struggle with that. That's not nice, and it's not fair, and it's not loving to that weaker brother. And that's what he's referring to. So, you know, we don't have that today. We don't have that application. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse, and you can write this down, verses 9 through 11, he says this. He says, be careful, however, that you exer the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block for the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you with all your knowledge eating in an idol's temple, uh, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. Can I give you what I think may be a closer modern day example of that? If you have a brother or sister who is saved out of alcoholism, and it's their faith in Christ brought them out of, and they believe that if they ever took another drink, that would be it. They would, they're just like, re, and they're new to Christ, and they just, they just absolutely say, you know, I can't even think about it. I can't go there because this is a real pull in my life, and it's a negative pull, and, and Christ brought me out of that. They could come, and they could have a view that says, you know, that's just not, I don't think I can do that, and maybe I don't think other Christians should do it either. But if you're a more mature Christian, you never had an issue with it, and you can drink it, you don't invite them over and say, hey, would you like a drink? 
You'd be sensitive and you'd say, you know, maybe we shouldn't drink wine or we shouldn't have alcohol at our meal today. Maybe we should take into account that this is a, a brother or sister that's struggling in this area and we're just not going to put it in their face. That's kind of what he's talking about. And so a, a disciple is sensitive. They don't want to be a, a stumbling block to, to Christians who haven't arrived. There's other ways that we can do that, though. And kind of surprising. Paul writes this in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Do you realize that as a parent, you can be a stumbling block for your children by treat, teaching them things that are wrong? And uh, You know, I'm, some of you are raised in Christian homes through guilt. And guilt's a great motivator. Yeah, you can make people feel guilty and get them to do just about anything. That's why when you come on the weekends here, probably you're not going to walk out thinking, well, he made me feel really guilty this weekend. Well, you know, I, I could turn up the guilt, the guilt dial, but frankly, I'd rather have the Holy Spirit convict you because that is really more to your soul and your heart than guilt. Guilt only lasts a little while. What I'm saying here is that as parents, we need to be careful that we're not putting stumbling blocks down for our children and how we raise them. And I think there's two stumbling blocks that parents make with their kids. And it's true today as it was when we were raising our kids. Number one, you set up too many boundaries. There's a boundary for everything. There's, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. So it's like the kid needs basically a binder of rules of what is appropriate and what isn't appropriate. That, that's, that, that, that could cause the, that child to be just like... I, the other is the opposite. And the opposite is, you know, we have no rules around here. You figure it out as you go along. You want to go to school? You want to go to church? Yeah, if you want to go, we'll go. If you don't want to go, we won't go. And you know, it's funny to me how some parents say, um, well, we want you to go to school and we want you to go to, you know, class and we want you to, you know, get involved in extracurricular. But if you decide not to be part of church, the church community, well, that's okay. Or other, you know, you know lenient rules. I think where we get into the problem here is we, we are a stumbling block in a sense that we don't set reasonable, loving, thoughtful boundaries for our kids. And those change as kids get older, right? You need to have more when they get younger and as they get older. We always said when, with more freedom comes more responsibility. If you violate your freedom, you lose. If you violate your, your freedom, you, we have to take more responsibility away from you and you get less freedom. Um, but you can do that. Here's another one. This is Proverbs 27, 5. It says, better, it is, better is open uh, rebuke than hidden love. Sometimes we don't do a person any favors because things that need to be said to people that we have close relationships to, we just don't say it. We don't discuss it with them. We don't say, hey, here's what I'm seeing. Tell me if I'm wrong here. I care about you, but I see you going down this path or I see these decisions and I just want you to know that I'm concerned about it. I hear you saying these words of anger, anger and, and hate or I see you, you know, these words of fear and, and worry and anxiety. What, what's going on there? And instead of saying something because you say, well, I just don't want to go through the conflict of it. See, that, that's what it means to be a family member. That's what it means to be part of the church is that, that we're, we said, I don't want to be a stumbling block. But you could be a stumbling block by not calling people out on their behavior. And again, that has to be done in a loving uh, you know, a, a relationship that is, is, that is going on. Let me give you another one. <clears throat> another example of what it means to be a disciple. Uh, you drastically deal with sin. You drastically, and that's the part where he talks about amputation. You know, if your, your hand is sinning, cut it off. Your leg is sinning, cut it off. Your eye is sinning, gouge it out. 
And, uh, you know, uh, it's interesting to me that nowadays, and this hasn't changed that much, that there are times where a doctor will, and you have family members and friends uh, that you, that have cancer. And the doctor will say, we found cancer in your leg. And they'll say, well, we could, we could treat it, but our concern is that the cancer will spread. So what do they do? They amputate it. They basically say, we've got to take this seriously. If we don't take this leg, you may, not, you may lose your life. And so Jesus is saying this about something that we don't take seriously, sin. He's saying, you know, you have to take sin almost in the same manner as you take treat cancer. And you say, well, Matt, what are you saying here? Um, I remember going to the library in Bible, Bible school, and I remember just kind of going through, I forget what I was doing a report on, but I came across this picture, and I still remember it. It's haunting. It showed three African men with a missionary with a big grin on his face standing there, American missionary, and each man had one of his eyes gouged out. And I thought, no, they didn't. Oh, yeah, they did. And I thought, oh, man. Did, did that what Jesus meant? Gouge your eye out? No, I don't think that's what he meant. I think he's using an overstatement here. But what he is saying is that playing around with sin can destroy your life if you don't deal with it quickly and completely. And as a disciple of Jesus Christ, I am absolutely convinced that we play with sin too much. We think that we can play around with it and it won't hurt us. We won't get hurt by it. But not only does it hurt us, it hurts the people around us. And we're seeing examples of that all, all around us. Here's another, uh, another trait we actively love others. Jesus said this in John chapter 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So there you have it. Um, another trait, and this is probably the most powerful one that when we're in this gospel tent, one of the, the traits isn't what do we believe or what do we not believe, which those are important. But more importantly, what the first thing that ought to, the first thing that should radiate from within the tent is that we have a deep concern, care, and love for one another. And that we show it in our words and our deeds towards one another. Let me give you another trait. By relentlessly pursuing holiness... Now, the pursuit of holiness today has become almost an exercise in checking off boxes. Um, have I had my morning devotions? Have I prayed? Have I read my Bible? Am I journaling? And this is all very personal. This is all very private. This is about me and God, and this is how holiness, it pers you know, holiness plays out. But here's the problem with that. All of these important pursuits, and they are important, but personal time with God and reading your Bible and prayer and you know, just spending time with God, that's absolutely necessary. But here's what happens. It, be, it, become, it can become legalistic. And we could be like a Pharisee and we can begin to look down on other people. Here's what I found. Holiness, in a nutshell, because we tend to think holiness is about our behavior, and it is, but it's more, we, we tend to define it like the Pharisees do. Well, I don't do that, and I don't do this, and I do do this, and I do this, and it's all about that. But I believe simply that holy living is simply keeping in step with the indwelling Holy Spirit each day. That's what I think holiness is. We're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and as we allow the Holy Spirit to indwell us, we are living holy lives, and we should be impacting our world in positive ways. That means the fruit of the Spirit should be on display in our lives rather than the fruit of the flesh. Now, as you think back in your li life this last week and the last couple of weeks, 
Would you say that you walked in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit demonstrating the fruit of the Spirit or the fruit of the flesh? You say, well, I don't know what those are. Well, you have the verses because I gave them to you. Galatians chapter 5. Let me read them to you right now. The acts of the flesh or the fruit of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. What he's saying here is, is this is the characterization of your life on an ongoing basis. You ought to say, does the Spirit of God even dwell within me? Now notice a lot of these traits are how we treat one another. Discord, hatred, jealousy, fits of rage, dissensions, factions, envy. Yeah, these are all, you know, relational, right? But then what does he say? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so I think that what we've done is we've turned a pursuit of holiness into this head game where we get knowledge about the Bible and we spend time in prayer and we say, God, help to make me holy. When God says, well, I'm going to not leave you alone, I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit. And as you walk in the Spirit, you are pursuing holiness. Disciples of Jesus Christ maintain their gospel witness. That's the next point. So he talks about this idea of, of salt. And in that day, salt was used to preserve things. It was used to push back decay. Uh, in, in a way, we're called to be pos a positive influence in our culture, in our world. We're to be salt and light. Uh, we're called to push back the darkness and show the distinctiveness of his kingdom. Jesus speaks of this in the Sermon on the Mount. Like I said, Jesus talked about this a number of times, and Mark is me mentioning the salt aspect of it. But Jesus said this in the Sermon on the Mount. And it's, he says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and let it, and let it, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I love the way that goes. It's, they see your good works. They don't glorify you. They glorify your Father in heaven. They must say, well, I know you. <laughs> There's only one way that you could be doing this. It must be God. So praise God. So how are we doing? A disciple of Jesus maintains a big gospel tent. And a disciple of Jesus guards their gospel witness. What is it in your life that as, you, as we've looked through those points, you would say, this is an area this weekend that I need to deal with. This is an area that, that, that I've, the Spirit of God is telling me you need to either start doing something about it or stop doing something. There's plenty of room for each one of us to say, what is it that we need to change? And so I will pray in a moment that the Holy Spirit would reveal that to your heart and that you'll take the Word of God and it will make a difference. James says the word of God can reflect things that are true in your life. And your job is to say that's true. Now what am I going to do about it? Am I just going to say oh okay and walk away and forget? Or am I going to remember and do something? Time will tell. Let me tell you where we're going next weekend. Next weekend we're going to talk about a very controversial topic. Uh, 
within the church. And the question that we're going to look at is, is divorce ever permissible with Jesus? That's where we're going to go in Mark chapter 10 next weekend. Let me pray with you right now. So, Father, help us. Uh, help us to be the disciples you've called us to be. Help us to understand that the tent is bigger, bigger than we often make it. And that we often exclude people that should be in the tent. And we don't exclude the people that should be not in the tent. Help us to look at just a few of the things that uh, we've examined this weekend. Help us not to be a stumbling block for little ones. Help us to take our sins seriously. Not to toy with it or play with it, but to deal with it very quickly and severely and openly. Help us to be salt to a world that is uh, becoming darker. Help us to be a light so that others see the Spirit of God within us and glorify our Father in heaven. May that be true in our lives more and more, day by day, week by week, month by month, Father. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.